Greetings and welcome to the 2021 Odyssey Asia Pacific Symposium. My name is George Ripsack. I'm director of the Odyssey uh, Coordinating Center at Columbia University, and I'm going to be talking about the state of the global community. I first want to thank uh, the APAC leadership for putting together this wonderful event. Odyssey is a special group of people. Shown in the first image is the garage where Apple Computer started, and it feels like Odyssey is a grassroots effort similar to that. And the lower left is a picture of the beach and the forest, and the leaders of Odyssey came together in various venues, including work at home in the shower, thinking about how to push forward this important initiative. In the center top, you see CERN, the physics effort, where hundreds of people come together with a common purpose. Of course, they have a billion dollars of funding, so perhaps we're more like the one on the in the center on the bottom, Open MRS, which pulls together a, a world population to uh, bring electronic health records to all countries through an open source effort. While I was putting together this slide, uh, I had just seen Satyagraha, which is Philip Glass's opera about Mahatma Gandhi. And it's important to learn from great things in history. And I was thinking about Odyssey's culture and how Glass uh, cast uh, Mahatma Gandhi's accomplishments. Odyssey has a culture of collaboration, encouragement, and tolerance. Its members have a generosity of time donating towards the effort. The pre preeminence of truth at Odyssey, that it's less important to uh, be famous and more important to get it right. And the necessity of action. We have to do more than talk about it. We actually have to move it forward and do it. Odyssey's mission, which we always review, is to improve health by empowering a community to collaboratively generate the evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care. And Odyssey's values are innovation, reproducibility, community, collaboration, openness, and beneficence. Odyssey's opening has grown to a large community with over 2,000 collaborators from 74 countries and six continents. Organizations from around the world are now engaged with Odyssey. I won't read them, but you see the magnitude of the, of the involvement from around the world. And Odyssey has many community initiatives and most of those international. Odyssey's work is based on working groups and we recently reformulated. Uh, previously, there were working groups and also leadership working in parallel. Now we've tried to move everything to working groups so there's more transparency in the organization and we can see how things move forward. And they're represented here in these many slides with members as many as 240 members in a working group. We also have regional chapters and centers shown here. Some of our regional chapters, which bring together, allow people to work in their uh, native languages and address their local needs while still working within the global framework. Also some centers, the Eden uh, Academy and Eden Initiative and the new Odyssey Center at Rue Institute. Odyssey has had its community calls since its beginning. It's recently involved the, evolved them to be more rigorous and more broad with presentations, debates, tutorials, uh, study reports, and so on. Uh, they're held at 11 Eastern time every Tuesday, but we have recordings so everyone from around the world can be part of them. Odyssey has focused on study of ponds, especially recently, and they've been the, the nidus for a number of important papers that have changed international policy. Odyssey has reworked its common data model so that instead of having some part ahead and some part behind, everyone could come together using version 5.4. Odyssey's vocabulary continues to grow with almost 10 million concepts and getting near 100 million concept relationships with the relationship among the vocabularies that are included shown here in this graph. And Odyssey has many data partners, 331 data sources with uh, data on over 810 million unique patients. And that's an incredible number. And it's over 10% of the world's population now in Odyssey's federated database. Odyssey builds open source software, the Hades uh, effort, uh, which pulls together uh, all their methods into open source software. And you can see in the graph on the upper, upper right are increasing use, and those are uh, measured in hundreds of thousands of uses. Open source software like Atlas, which provides a user interface for exploring data, analysis, producing code, and generating evidence. We perform uh, theoretical methods research, which are published in uh, top journals around the world and have been influence, influential on the field. 
We've taken a very um, rigorous approach to producing reliable evidence that's repeatable, reproducible, replicable, generalizable, robust, and calibrated. And really, if you think about it, much of our time goes into producing evidence uh, that can be repeated and that can be trusted. We've enumerated uh, our principles as the 10 legend principles, producing evidence at large scale, evidence not depending whether it gets published, doesn't depend on the size of the treatment effect and so on. And these were published in a paper in Jamia. We then use these principles in uh, real clinical studies. Our first big area being light legend hypertension uh, shown here. Uh, with a recent paper on ACE inhibitors versus ARBs, for which I'm still getting email about the results. We also do patient level prediction, that is uh, not just evidence uh, across a population, but how do individual patients might be affected by a drug, positive or negatively. And we've come up with a rigorous framework in which too we can judge the evidence. Again, uh, not just producing predictive models, but judging the reliability and reproducibility of those models. All of this produces publications that what we show here is the Odyssey community where it's linked together in terms of publications. And uh, so here's a graph of the Odyssey uh, members who have published at least two papers. And you can see some patterns in here, like uh, some people from the early OMOP effort that preceded Odyssey, some working on the common data model, the tools, the vocabulary, some of our collaborators in I2B2, Emerge, and PCORnet, and all of us, and some focusing on specific things like uh, oncology on the top. But in some ways, the more interesting part of this diagram is that it was it's actually not that easy to separate, and that's because Odyssey is an integrated community, and most people who work in Odyssey work in several of these areas at once. And that's part of our strength, is that the same people who are defining the data model are also generating evidence. So when we make changes to the data model, it's for the purpose of improving our mission, which is to generate evidence. As I said, our publications have been strong, and as you can see, uh, we've published uh, 334 publications as of September of this year. We did a lot of work in COVID-19 starting in March of 2020 and moving through with several important papers and initiatives published in top journals from around the world, shown here. There's some interesting studies. This one was looking at evidence that was generated by Odyssey and by others and how it influenced policy, how the use of drugs, different treatments changed over time and correlating that with evidence when it's uh, generated. So Odyssey generally uh, generates evidence at large scale, the Scylla and Charybdis efforts doing um, comparative effectiveness research and doing characterization research, both at large scale published in uh, many journals. And vaccine surveillance is one of our major focuses, which has had major influence. For example, the uh, 2021 March 18 uh, turning AstraZeneca vaccine back on was based largely on Odyssey's study of background rates shown to the left. And also important studies in methods research and what are the biases have influenced protocols used around the world. I'm now gonna turn it on uh, over to Patrick Ryan uh, to talk, speak with you further. Thanks, George. I'm Patrick Ryan. I'm at Janssen R&D in Columbia University, and today I'd like to walk you through uh, some of my reflections about the work in the Odyssey APAC community this year. George told you that the Odyssey community, we're all around the world, and we're all part of this journey together. Uh, and I actually think that that's an important part of what it is about our global community that makes us unique is that we truly are trying to take a global perspective to global public health questions. My thesis for this presentation that I'm going to provide you is the following, that Odyssey needs APAC and APAC needs Odyssey. And I think I'll be able to show you why it's so important for a global community that we have such strong leadership as we currently do in the Asia Pacific region. You know, one of our first studies we did in the Odyssey community was this paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that George Ripsack led, uh, characterizing treatment pathways at scale. And even at the time, we had representation um, in the Asia Pacific region with Ray Park and, and Nicole Pratt being part of this work. But one of the things that was most stunning about this effort was to realize that treatment really is different around the world. I'm just showing you one of our quick examples here in the case of type 2 diabetes. 
I'm showing you the treatment trajectory of patients in a US database, in a database in the UK, in a database in Japan. And the colors represent the different treatments. The sequence of treatments are represented uh, by the sunbursts that have now become a tool that we commonly use in the Odyssey community. But even back then, we saw something pretty st stunning, that care around the world is fundamentally different. And how are we supposed to learn about the appropriate treatments unless we know what those differences are and we can actually thoroughly explore them? The fact that in the UK, a drug glipizide is used as a common second line therapy, which is not even available in the US, or the fact that in Japan, we don't see metformin being used as first line therapy as, as regularly as in other countries, is an indication of the fact that there's heterogeneity in treatment around the world. And we as a global community have the opportunity to tackle that. And it's been this idea that's really excited me about trying to build this global community. And what particularly excites me is about all the progress that's been made in the Asia Pacific uh, community this year. Now, how does Odyssey work? George talked about this, but I'm going to take this in a little bit of depth to show not only what we're doing together as a global community, but what the APAC region is really leading in these areas. As a community, we collaborate on open community data standards, open source development, methodologic research, and clinical evidence generation. We know that each of these components are required for us to generate reliable evidence, but no individual, no organization can tackle this on their own. Now, Odyssey is also a large data network, and George highlighted the breadth of the community that we have. But what it means to be a distributed data network is that a given data source has made a decision to convert their data using Odyssey's open community data standards and to use the open source analysis tools that are available. And while we can think about this collaborations contributing to those standards and those tools, what we're also talking about is enabling a distributed network that can physically be anywhere around the world, allowing us to learn locally and learn globally. Now, what Odyssey is also doing is running network studies. This idea that anyone in the world, whether you're sitting in Singapore or Taiwan or the Netherlands or Canada, could specify a question frame that question as an analysis uh, code that could be sent to any database around the world, contributing back aggregate summary statistics without uh, risking anything to do with patient privacy, and that we as a global community can collaboratively interpret and disseminate that evidence. And this is how we work, whether it be uh, uh, a group of individuals in an academic institution or a government agency uh, or within industry, whether we're talking about something that's happening in North America or Europe or across Asia Pacific. What I'm really proud of about the Odyssey APAC community is the leadership that has taken place across all of these dimensions. And I'd really like to highlight the success that you all have had in 2021. George mentioned that we have over 340 publications in the Odyssey community, and we are growing substantially in terms of our academic scholarship that we're putting out there. Um, but but while, while the, the numbers are big and abstract, I'd like to drill down into some of the things that I think are pretty impressive that came out of APAC this year. Uh, just this year, we saw a paper published by Kim et al. that actually focused specifically on our open community data standards looking at a unique problem associated with uh, data that one might want to capture to appropriately diagnose sleep apnea. And in this work, we the work was demonstrated how we can take source data, uh, both the orders of appropriate procedures as well as the measurements and results, and it can standardize that to the OMOP common data model. This type of data standards work is actually opening the doors to the, our community around the world, studying diseases in ways we haven't done before. Another paper that was really nice to see this year was uh, an incorporation of the Korean electronic data interchange vocabulary into the OMOP vocabulary. And this paper by Sung et al. Uh, had collaborations at a Ju University and the Health Insurance Review and Assessment Service in Korea, as well as other members of the Odyssey community. And what's important here is that there are source vocabularies that may be used across different clinical domains uh, and across an entire uh, country. Um, but if, if we're going to work as one global community, we need to be able to standardize and speak the same language. And this was a really nice demonstration of how a vocabulary that hadn't yet been standardized to an international standard could go through a rigorous process to make that information credible and reliable, making it even more possible for colleagues in Korea to be able to collaborate with those 
around the other parts of the world. This year, we also saw really nice work led by Park and, and Chan et al. Um, with collaborations across multiple institutions, establishing a framework for the annotation of unstructured electronic health record data, Socrates. And here, what's really nice about this is both we are focusing here on the data standard problem of how to structure uh, free text information, but also providing very useful open source tools that can enable this to be implemented in other institutions. And what the authors highlighted here was the ability to take electronic health record data from different institutions and by standardizing to the OMOP common data model, providing a structure by which that information can be uh, parsed, uh, structured, uh, and annotated such that it can then be brought back in for analysis purposes. We've also seen really interesting innovation in the methodologic research space. This paper by Shin et al. Uh, actually looked at pharmacovigilance from the perspective of how can we learn from electronic health record data side by side with spontaneous adverse event reporting data. And this paper was really intriguing because this is a, a problem that we know we need to be able to tackle internationally. How do we learn from our disparate connection of electronic health record data sources? Now we combine that with what's been learned from other sources. And within the global Odyssey community, we've been thinking a lot about the questions of spontaneous data. And there's been other Odyssey collaboratives that have standardized the US spontaneous adverse event reporting database fares into an OMOP instance. But here you saw data from Korea, data from the US being combined together as a nice proof of principle. And this is the kind of work that I think uh, demonstrates how uh, researchers in APAC can be leaders of something that can have a global impact. Shung Soo Kim uh, and colleagues published this paper in Jamia uh, earlier this year, focused on applying machine learning models to predict cause of death using ensemble methods. Uh, and I thought that this paper was a really important piece of methodologic research that also demonstrated the power of our global community's effort to develop patient level prediction capabilities. Uh, in this work, um, uh, Sheng Zhu actually showed how that not only can we actually try to infer what was the reason why somebody had died based on their prior medical history, but also to develop a model in one source somewhere in the world and go apply it to other sources. And to see the data used from Maju University uh, be applied to US claims data is a really remarkable accomplishment that's only possible if we take this global world view. And I was really excited to see, um, see this work uh, get published in a, a high profile informatics journal. Now, one of the papers that's recently been accepted in Frontiers in Pharmacology is another methodologic work that I'm quite proud of. As a community, we have come together to think about the question about how to do vaccine safety surveillance right. In the context of our COVID vaccines, it's critically important that we're using our electronic health record data as fully as possible to study uh, these products. And uh, leaders from the APAC community, including Nicole Pratt and, and Thamir, uh, have actually come together with colleagues in US and uh, across Europe to think about how to develop methodologic experiments. Uh, Martin Shumi's led this effort called Eumaeus, and it's already started to result in a series of publications. What I, reason I'm highlighting this is not only for the empirical result we found, which is that current practices being used in US, Europe, uh, and, and the Asia Pacific region are likely fallible to a high risk of false positive findings, generating unnecessary worries about safety issues, but also the fact that we as a global community across regions can come together uh, to systematically study this question and produce scholarship. And so it's nice to see the first paper from this global collaborative coming out, but we also are eagerly anticipating other papers coming out from the community, including those led by leaders in the APAC uh, region. And this paper that was published in JMI, JMIR Medical Informatics by Yun and all, uh, characterizes anti-cancer treatment trajectory uh, and patterns in patients receiving chemotherapy. I think this is a nice example where the Odyssey community at large is really interested in the potential opportunities for uh, oncology. And we've seen leadership in the A Asia Pacific region in thinking about exactly how we can start to use data to study this. 
And uh, there's really nice demonstrations of how we have to think about multi multimodal treatments, not just thinking about pharmacologic treatments, but also thinking about surgeries and other types of interventions and how we can actually use uh, treatment trajectories as a way to understand what's going on in patients' lives. And by using our global network, we can start to ask questions about how is the experience at Azu University in Korea similar or different to other countries in the Asia Pacific region or other countries around the world. One of the papers we're quite proud of in the Odyssey community is our work in studying COVID disease natural history. And this paper that was published in BMJ, led by Albert Prats Uribe, looked at the use of repurposed and adjuvant drugs in COVID-19. Um, you'll notice that there's a long list of authors here, and that included many members of the Asia, Asia Pacific region. Um, but what I'm really proud about about this paper is not only that we were able to characterize the rise and fall of hydroxychloroquine as new evidence came to be, but that we were the first in, to, to my knowledge, still only uh, research community that was able to put a side-by-side -side comparison of the real-world experience of patients in China, next to those in Korea, next to those in Europe, and next to those in across multiple databases in the United States. And this idea that we as an Odyssey community can take a global lens to gain local insights within individual countries, but then make comparisons across countries, I think is one of the powerful opportunities that we have. And so it's great to have the APAC community uh, participating in these global studies and leading the charge so that we can learn from across our respective uh, locations. Now, George mentioned the legend principles, and he highlighted that we've had a wealth of papers that are published uh, uh, based on these principles. What I want to specifically highlight is the leadership uh, that's coming from the APEC region. Uh, Chan uh, was the lead author of one of the papers published in Hypertension. This is a paper, uh, uh, Comprehensive Comparative Effectiveness and Safety of First-Line Beta Blocker Monotherapy in Hypertension Patients. And this paper is actually quite important, um, not only because it represents a good example of clinical evidence led by the APAC community, but also because clinically what it found was that uh, beta blockers as a recommended treatment uh, seem to have increased risk associated with cardiovascular outcomes relative to other viable first-line therapies, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. And the reason why this is notable is because one of the things that we recognize is that clinical guidelines themselves are not consistent around the world. Whereas the uh, American College of Cardiology uh, guidelines for hypertension specifically call out beta blockers as not a recommended first line therapy. And so too did the Japanese Society of Hypertension. In contrast, the uh, 2018 uh, Korea Society for Hypertension suggested that beta blockers may be a viable first-line therapy. So if we can use the world's data to learn about recommendations, we can start to generate evidence that might inform which of these guidelines uh, make sense and which guidelines might be appropriate for the individual patients in care. And by us working together, we can actually start to resolve some of these seemingly inconsistent recommendations with hard evidence that supports what's going on locally as well as across multiple organizations and, and the countries. Now, what I've really shared for you is why Odyssey needs APAC. Uh, your leadership in all of this work has been, has been extraordinary this year, particularly during a trying time when we're all just trying to get by. Um, but I wanna also assert that APAC needs Odyssey. And I think that the legend work is a really good demonstration of exactly why. What I'm showing you here is a screenshot from the legend uh, 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 browser showing you the meta-analysis comparing beta blockers versus ch calcium channel blockers. So this is similar to the results that were in Chan's paper. And what I'm showing you is a meta-analysis with a forest plot of the effect estimates across each of our different databases. And I want to specifically call your attention to the effect estimate from JMDC, our Japanese claims data, which provided a calibrated effect estimate of 0.7 with a confidence interval that ranged from 0 0.25, 0 0.26 to 2.04. What that was saying is if that we only had access to the Japanese claim data alone, and we had to answer the question, do beta blockers have an increased risk of myocardial infarction relative to calcium channel blockers? Our answer would be, I don't know. And I'll also call your attention to our data in Korea. 
that produced an effect estimate of 2.2 with a confidence interval from 1.1 to 4.3. And if you only had access to the Korean data and you ask the question, does beta blockers increase the risk of MI relative to calcium channel blockers? Your answer might actually be yes, and it's a pretty large effect. But it's only when we have the world's data together that we can combine estimates from the US and Europe and Asia Pacific together that we can produce a composite summary estimate. And what you can see here is our meta-analysis estimate is 1.3 with a confidence interval of 1.14 to 1.46. What this is suggesting is that we did indeed observe a relatively consistent effect across a range of databases showing that beta blockers do indeed have a small increased risk relative to calcium channel blockers. What you'll notice is this composite estimate it's fully within the estimate of Japan. That is to say, we didn't learn anything different. It's just that Japan's answer was, I don't know. And Korea's answer was an effect estimate that was actually larger than the overall estimate. But there's no inconsistency here. Our overall estimate is fully in line with all of our databases. So we have an opportunity uh, to come together to generate evidence that is truly credible, uh, that can allow us to understand when we observe consistent effects across populations, when we can resolve the uncertainty that might exist in a given population, or when we can hope to mitigate the possibility that any one data source may have a particular bias. And by working together, uh, not only does Odyssey need APAC and all of your leadership, um, but together, APAC needs Odyssey because we can generate global evidence that can inform care around the world. And I think that the legend study is a great demonstration of what's possible, what we have done, and really serves as a model for how we should be thinking about collaborating more fully. Now, just this last weekend uh, in the USA Today, which is a popular newspaper in the United States, there was an article featuring Odyssey. It was titled electronic medical records have been around for decades and their power to help other patients is starting to be unleashed. And this article featured uh, one of our own Odyssey collaborators, Jamie Weaver, who talked about his own personal uh, story. And he ended, his, he end, the quote at the end of this article says, the future of medical care, Weaver hopes, will be one where every clinical decision can be made as he, his was, confidently, and directly informed by all available evidence. Now, this is a newspaper article in a US uh, circulation, but it's really reflecting the global nature of the intent of what we are all here as Odyssey as a global community to try to address. Note that Jamie in this US article is actually a Canadian, uh, and note that the data that we needed to use to inform his care came from all around the world. All of you helped contribute to Jamie's story. But this one story shouldn't be an anecdote that we focus on. This one story should actually be an inspiration about why we all need to come together to answer the questions locally within the individual countries in the APAC region, for us to think regionally about what we can learn across the APAC region, but also for us to think about globally how we can impact clinical decisions for every patient everywhere around the world. That's what we're capable of and we have the opportunity to do if we collaborate together. So with that, I wanna thank you all for being on this journey with us. I wanna congratulate the Odyssey APAC community on their tremendous success this year. And I really look forward to this Odyssey APAC symposium being a great opportunity where we can forge new collaborations uh, together as we continue to try to advance our mission of improving care for patients all around the world. And now I have the distinct honor to announce this year's Odyssey 2021 Best Community Contribution Awards. Uh, based on the submissions to our Odyssey Annual Symposium. Uh, these were voted on by the community, and it's great to be able to announce the winners here at Odyssey APAC. Our first winner of the Best Community Contribution Award goes to Monica Rue and team for their work extending the Odyssey CDM to store the output of NLP pipelines. Our second Best Community Contribution Award goes to Anna Ostropolitz and team for her work, the concept of anchoring in vaccine safety studies and its influence on baseline patient characteristics and study estimates. We are excited to announce the best community contribution award 
to Praveen Kumar, Christoph Lambert and team for their work detecting PTSD and self-harm amongst US veterans using positive unlabeled learning. Our fourth best community con contribution award goes to Kimberly Dickinson and team for their work, Gold or Lead, Adjudicating Differences Between CDM Data and Chart Reviews. And the final Best Community Contribution Award goes to Kelly Lee and team for competing risk regression models in cohort studies with the R package cohort method. I'm going to congratulate all of this year's Odyssey 2021 Best Community Contribution Award winners um, for their great work. Thank the community for voting on this exceptional work uh, and uh, encourage everybody to take a look at this scholarship and uh, continue to collaborate towards future awards. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, our esteemed colleague and 2021 Odyssey Titan Award winner for leadership, Mui Van Zant. Hi, my name is Mui Van Zant. I'm a senior director of OMOP Data and that works within IQVIA. Um, again, just like George and Patrick said, welcome to the 2021 Asia Pacific Symposium. Alrighty, today I am here to talk to you a little bit about our 2021 journey in Asia Pacific and what we've been able to accomplish and what we set for actually what we set for at the beginning of the year to now where we are, you know, at towards the end of the year. Okay, just a little reminder for everybody, there are currently six chapters inside the Asia Pacific community. Um, you can see here Korea started with us first, then China. Um, and then you can see here Japan, Australia, uh, Singapore, and Taiwan. So overall, we currently now have six chapters. Now, before I go in and talk about our journey into Odyssey, I do want to thank a couple of folks first, or a few folks, and that's the APAC Community Operations Team. Um, I want to say thank you because these folks have helped us throughout 2021 in organizing all the different uh, events that we've had, including the APAC community calls, the tutorials, and even the symposium. Uh, it's all organized by volunteers in the back end, such as Jing Chan Jordan from IQVIA, and then Catherine from the University of South uh, Australia, and Grace from Hong Kong University. Without them, there is no way we could have pulled all of this off. Okay. So, what was our goal? What did we want to accomplish at the beginning? So, if you think about APAC, we first started as those individual chapters. And in 2020, we decided to come together as one regional uh, community and formed ourselves as the APAC community. And we hosted our first uh, APAC symposium last year in December. Um, from there, we decided in 2021, we would set some goals for ourselves, right? And taking guidance from the um, global community, we did an OCR. So we decided on the OCR of enabling APAC community to better understand the o Odyssey ecosystem in order to collaborate in more observational research. And the three areas that we focused on was education programs across the region, OMOP conversions, and collaborative publications. So when we began this journey, how did we really accomplish each one of these? So let me go take you into goal number one, education. Above and beyond the different educations that were given within the regions, we also did some overall APAC um, training courses as well that went across all the regions. For example, this APAC ETL uh, training that we did in August. It was actually the first ETL training that we did in the Asia Pacific uh, community, focusing really on data analysis and development, how to de do development, now actually the development. And in there, we had a lot of hands-on exercises and lectures that help people better truly understand what it really took to do an ATL conversion. Overall, we had 140 uh, registered uh, folks and anywhere between 60 to 80 people showed up because it was a two-day course. Right, and to get 60 and 80 people to dedicate themselves for two days, eight hours each day was quite a big accomplishment. 
you can see here on day one, we did uh, some of the analysis areas using White Rabbit, Usagi, and Rabbit in the hat. And then day two, we talked about some of the common issues, which helped a lot of folks better understand what are some of the challenges that they would run into, as well as touching on the data quality uh, tools that are out there in the community. So this training was it was a great success, and I think a lot of folks learned really what it meant to do an ETL conversion and who they can reach out to when they have issues, right? The other thing that we did that we started at the beginning of the year was to start more education and communication around the community as a whole. So we started the APAC community calls, uh, which are biweekly in Odyssey Teams. Um, it's every Thursday morning, noontime Korean time. Um, and our next two calls are December 2nd and December 16th. And if you want to know more about there, there's the site down here. But throughout these calls, we try to communicate and educate folks on what's going on within the APAC community, but also what's going on in the global Odyssey community. For example, um, on October 21st, you can see here, we talked about the legend initiative that's going on in the global community on uh, type two diabetes and how uh, the Asia Pacific community can actually participate in that. There were times where we did things like mini tutorials that were actually played, or we had folks come in and talk about those. We, there were also other times where we had updates from the regional chapters talking about what they've been doing. Um, and of course, the Odyssey Center that you see here that uh, we had Kristen come in and present. So it is really a, a, an environment where we want to be able to educate all of the Asia Pacific folks and bring the global community and the Asia Pacific community even closer. Okay. So then there's goal number two, right? Goal number two is really around uh, converting their data into OMOP because before we can do research, we really have to have a lot of the, these data assets in OMOP. And that was a lot of our focus this year. Therefore, that's why you saw the ETL training that we had. And I have to say that if you look in the uh, journey book that was displayed uh, or you received if you attended the global symposium, on page 36 and 37 is the list of data standards and all the collaborators that are in Odyssey right now that has data. If you look in that book right now, you'll see a lot of Asia Pacific organizations in there, and that's a great sight to see. Um, overall, right now, we have more than 70 either converted or ongoing conversions happening in Asia Pacific, and that's a great accomplishment that I think everybody should be you know, very proud of. So what I'm going to go into a little bit about is each one of those chapters and where they are. So Korea, of course, is always ahead of the game. Many of their, um, you know, uh, organizations already has their data in OMOP. So now they're thinking about how to enhance those. For example, they're working on uh, doing automated CDM refreshes on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, instead of just on a quarterly or a monthly basis, they're trying to figure out how they can do it on a daily, weekly basis, which makes the data a lot more recent than you know many of our CDMs. They're also working on their national uh, Korea vocabulary mapping, all the uh, national drugs and national um, vocabulary, turning that and converting that into the OMOP CDM. Um, what I don't show also, they're focusing on data quality and how to utilize and improve the data quality um, apps and tools that are out there for the use of the Korean community. China, they actually now have 10 databases that are ready and uh, available to use in OMOP. Jiangsu uh, People's Hospital, which actually I'll talk about a little bit later inside the publication section, but they are participating in the APAC hypertension study. We have uh, this uh, Yingzhou district level, Ningbo City launched new patient data. There's three psychiatry hospitals out there that are also on OMOP, as well as five hospitals in the Zhejiang uh, province. So quite a few conversions that's already been done and excited to see them and hoping that they will actually join the journey and join more studies in the future to come. Australia, lots and lots of progress there too. 
Um, there's quite a few active secondary care uh, conversions going on, but one of the things that they did do, uh, you can see here, is the conversion of primary care EMR. Recently, there was a funding to help improve primary health care, so they're planning on doing all that. They've also taken their uh, that 10% of the national claim system and converted that to OMOP. They have quite a few organizations that are in OMOP. You can see 30 organizations with five active conversions. And within uh, Australia themselves, they've had 16 publications so far. So lots of different activities going on there. Nicole and team are doing a great job over there getting more folks involved in Odyssey. Singapore. Again, another exciting chapter here. Uh, Morning and folks are leading their way to help adapt um, this government adaption, this government funded program to take nine of the hospitals, which is actually the entire uh, country of Singapore, and putting them onto OMOP and using OMOP as the underlying foundation for their research program. And they've also transformed one of their EHR questionnaire data into OMOP. And one of their publications uh, recently is now in AMIA's Applied Clinical Informatics Journal. So again, a lot of progress going on in Singapore. Taiwan um, joined us last year with uh, Taipei Medical University. And they spent the year not just only getting their database the three hospitals that they have onto the OMOP CDM, but also getting it research ready. As you can see here, they actually are fully built now and supported on Atlas and is 100% ready to do research. Thanks to Jason and Mark over there. Um, last but not least, there is Japan. And uh, they are really doing an exploratory phase this year, trying to understand more on the education side and also on the logistics side, like the vocabulary mapping, trying to get their vocabulary, their drug condition and lab tests mapped over to the standard first before they can do a conversion. And they're doing a lot of education pieces over there on you know just what is the book how do you use the book how do we use usagi how do we use the different applications that are out there in order to help even build an omop odyssey community there and they got funding recently to do a program an education program so look out for that uh, where they'll come up with really nice websites and other things that will help educate the folks in japan so that is really all the wonderful and amazing things that are going on with the conversion work, but we don't stop there. Um, Asia Pacific, again, we have a lot of stuff going on, and I'm very proud to say that these folks have been able to accomplish a lot. So our goal number three is really the APAC publication. So again, after conversions, what we want to be able to do is actually contribute to the community and contribute to research, right? So above and beyond what I just talked about among some of the chapters and what the chapter regional leads will talk about, about their own publications, I want to bring up the journey of our first uh, joint APAC publication. And that I'm sure you've heard of is the hypertension, APAC hypertension study that we uh, took the principles from legend. So you can see here, it's the journey that we've built. Um, it started in 2020 when we formed Asia Pacific. And when we first started, we didn't think that we'd be able to get this far. And we thought about, you know, breaking things and chunking things up. So you can see here in 2020, we did the initiation of the study and we started doing feasibility and cohort characterization. Uh, and we published it in the, the uh, global symposium as a poster to say, hey, here's what we're doing. Back then, we didn't have all the sites up and available, right? Back then, we, I think we had three or four countries that were ready and not all of them had data that was ready. They wanted to contribute, but none of, not all their data was ready. So um, as we went in Q1, we started adding more partners in China and Taiwan. We refined the protocol and we started building the, uh, the treatment pathway that we wanted to use. And as you can see in Q2, we finalized the protocol, we got Atlas installed, we added more partners and as we kept going, we were able to finalize it and actually put it out there in a journal submission. And I'm glad to say that right now we are waiting for the final acceptance inside JAMA network, open networks. Um, and it's a great accomplishment. 
but it would not have happened if we didn't have all the collaboration that we did amongst the folks that we we had, right? So, you know, throughout this journey, I remember at the beginning of this journey, uh, Professor um, Yuan and also Chan and Nicole from uh, Australia, all of these guys were trying to understand how to put this protocol together, how to even build this, right? Uh, Jing and folks from the IQVIA team were working with them to build it up, to understand what it took and how to work with each one of these individual uh, organizations because it's the first time we're doing this in Asia Pacific. I know we ran into problems, especially when we were doing things like treatment pathway, for example, when we had to work with Jason and the Taiwan team to get Atlas up and running and we were troubleshooting to figure out what was wrong so that we didn't have to send them on our package on the side. Right. I remember working with Silva uh, from Mornings Group in Singapore trying to get um, the package running because they were in a restricted area that had no internet. So then you had to figure out how to run things uh, in an environment that did not have internet when you had to upload packages and all that. So we had a lot of hiccups, we had a lot of challenges, but I have to say it was a fun, amazing, lots of lessons learned journey that we've went through. And as a result, we have five different Asia Pacific countries that has participated in this study, as well as eight uh, data assets within those five um, countries that are, many of them are brand new to the community. Many of them, it's the first time doing a, 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 a such a big study uh, together with us. And you can see here, these are some of the results from the um, characterization as well as the treatment pathways that is now going to be part of the publication. So again, a lot of stuff, a lot of journeys were that a lot of, I should say journey that we've went through and a lot of bumps that we hit, but really, really great collaboration, a lot of effort that went into it. And without the help of not only the chapter leads, but also the community itself, I don't think we would have been able to get this done, right? We have all the chapter leads trying to help push this. Nicole in Australia, Chan in Korea, uh, Professor Haramatsu in Japan, Morning in um, Singapore, we got Jason in Taiwan, and Hua in China, right? Without these leaders, there's no way we have been able to push all the work that you have seen that I presented on forward. Now, what do we look forward to in 2022? Because this is a recap of 2021, right? So what I would love to see is more people join our journey. Join our journey in any of the ways that you've seen us do so far in the OMOP conversions. Come to our training, come to our APAC community calls. Let us know what you want, right? As well as participate in all these studies that we are going to be doing and all these studies that we want to be doing in 2022. So come join our journey. The first way to start that is join our community call or even sign in the Odyssey teams. So again, thank you very much. Um, please do join our journey if you have not. Now that you've heard a bit about our journey and hopefully we've gotten you interested in journey, joining our journey, uh, I'm gonna give you a little uh, insights on how the rest of the day is gonna go. Alrighty, so if you see on my screen here, uh, we I just finished with uh, providing you with the Apex Data community. We're gonna take a little break, but then when we come back, you see that we got Peter uh, Reinbeck, who will talk about Eden, as well as Christian, who will give a little insights on FIRE and the Oma uh, Odyssey collaboration. After that, we will have a, another short energy break and the chapter leads will bring you guys up to speed on what they've accomplished uh, a little bit more in detail as well as the vision of 2020. And inside there, actually, we would love for you to stay for that and join us to vote on the study that you would like us to concentrate on in 2022. Um, but the, the fun and excitement does not stop there. We'll give you a little lunch break. And in the afternoon, we will have an, our networking session. Now the networking session will actually be in Gather Town. It is not in Odyssey Teams. It's a separate link that you would have gotten that had the information about how to get into Gather Town. 
Um, it will also be in your meeting invitation that we sent out. Um, and if you don't know the password, we will give you the password in uh, the chat as well. But in there, uh, we have three different hours worth of networking. And I'm very pleased to introduce some of the folks that actually will be there as guest speakers and guest collaborators. So it, uh, starting with the first session, we have three different working group breakouts. We have uh, Chan, uh, Professor Chan Yu, who will actually be running up the medical imaging working group. So if you want to learn about the medical imaging working group, please go and visit Chan. We have a uh, professor, uh, not professor, apologies, Christian Reich, as well as Adam Chi, and who I don't ha have here, Mark uh, from Taiwan, who will be actually uh, having the working group on fire and OMOP and how we can collaborate and more of an open discussion of how that collaboration will go. Then we also have special guests from Claire, who is the leader of the um, uh, CDM and vocabulary working group. who will come talk to you about 5.4. So if you want to understand 5.4, what are all the things that they've done to 5.4 and the packages that they've created in order to help us with 5.4, that is time for you to uh, talk to Claire. Um, and then the second session is going to be our collaboration showcase, so visit us. We will have nine different posters um, that originated from the Asia Pacific side, and some of the uh, actual poster owners will be there to speak with you. The third hour uh, is going to be on APAC um, study session, which we have a guest speaker, Mark Shashard, who will talk to you a little bit about how studies should work. And it's more of a working session. Like I said, you're going to get a chance to vote for the three top studies, type of studies we want to do. And those are what we're going to actually talk about during that last session in the networking um, gather town session. So don't miss out on any of these. Come when you want. But it does start at 1300 hour Korean standard time. Um, so see you uh, later on in gather town. For now, take a break and come back for all the other sessions that we have. So uh, this artist community is really welcoming and warm society. And this shows that uh, we can democratize the data science in healthcare. So, you know, uh, usually we, uh, some big guys owns the data, healthcare data, and they conducted their own studies for their own uh, purpose, but in the artist community, everyone can uh, collaborate with uh, for uh, international studies without even uh, they don't have access to the uh, big data. So it is really a great opportunity for uh, junior faculties or junior researchers uh, who can who want to you know uh, conduct the international uh, big data research. So this is a thrilling. Uh, opportunity for uh, you know junior uh, researchers or the researchers in third uh, countries i joined odyssey five or six years ago and i must say must say that now it's a completely different landscape and a completely different organization from where we used to be and what excites me the most is that whatever question you might have or the background or the research interests you can actually come to the community and community will help you to address your questions, both in terms of maybe changing CDMs, maybe gathering new data, maybe finding and applying new methods. And I don't think that you can find that in any other community. So just this traction that you get with your new or old research questions, this is something that you cannot see anywhere else. So please come and ask your questions and everybody will be helpful and will be excited to help you and also to participate in your research. I think like the, it's the growth. Odyssey is expanding so much right now. We're getting so much more data. Everyone's seeing the value of the network and the community that we're just gonna get better and better over time. And the methods research we're doing to make sure that we are the, doing the, the best quality research as well. Um, it's just, there's nothing that compares out there. I think Odyssey has the opportunity to change the way medicine is practiced, literally. 
There's so much that we don't know, uh, but that we have the observational data to answer a lot of questions. I mean, a hypertension study is a perfect example where we have those 28 meds that are first line and we can perhaps tease out which ones should go first. Same for the next project we plan, diabetes, type two diabetes, second line agents. I think we can march through medicine and answer a lot of questions that people don't think we can answer. And that um, the expectation of what can come from evidence generation will change. One thing I think that's really special about Odyssey is that everyone comes in with different specialties and expertise and experience. And I think that's something that really excites me about the potential of Odyssey is incorporating everyone's ideas and um, their their experiences to really build a strong, stronger um, foundation for science and data collection. I think we're, we're learning as a community to better interact and to improve and it's growing bigger and more people from diverse backgrounds are coming in and, and giving the expertise and, and the ways of doing things and I think it's very exciting to see the community grow and new ideas and, and new things being developed and every time we do it better and quicker and, and yeah, it's, it's quite exciting. What excites me uh, the most about, you know, the potential of Odyssey, uh, especially for being, you know, in charge of the Asia Pacific world, uh, I, I think that's very exciting because there's a lot of data and there's a lot of things that we don't know, science, right? We just don't know a lot. Um, so being able to see how well these groups and all these different organizations can come together and solve a problem. Uh, especially like right now, we did the whole hypertension study in Asia Pacific. That was an eye opener for a lot of people to see how all the different treatments are being utilized and why they're being utilized. But without something like this, this would it, it would take too long. It would take a long time for all the groups to be able to come together to see such evidence gathered and such results being explained and such results being found basically right so i see a great future in that and being able to see that especially on the asia pacific side it makes me very excited that we can do so much more with the data that we have around the globe
Hello everyone. My name is Peter Rijnbeek. I'm an Associate Professor of Health Data Science at the Department of Medical Informatics at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, I'm also the coordinator of a very interesting project called EDEN, which stands for European Health Data and Evidence Network. And my presentation is about, uh, about this exciting project and I'd like to update you on the progress we've made so far um, in the project. Uh, so let's get started. So in Europe, uh, we of course also like to generate reliable evidence at scale as we do all over the world and where Odyssey has, has its strength. Um, we want to build reliable evidence on many different types of uh, data sources in Europe, but also for many different types of research questions. Um, and you all are, are aware of the challenges um, that are out there to do this at, at the scale that is required. So you've probably seen this um, this this presentation or this this diagram before uh, of the uh, the iron showing that like an analytical tool that you want to apply on on, on your data uh, with the challenges that uh, the structure of the data is different but also the terminology systems are different and I, I can tell you that in in Europe uh, there are many many different types of terminologies and that is a is a big issue if we want to run multi database studies. Um, so the need for the OMO common data model and the tools is, is very, very clear uh, in Europe. Um, so we need to improve the data interoperability, uh, but we also need to develop many different types of standardized analytics and, and reuse the analytical tools that Odyssey has been building, um, build a strong data network. So we need to have many different types of data sources from different geographic areas, uh, but also different, uh, different types like hospital data or GP data in a large data network and we need to make sure that uh, there is a very strong uh, community uh, in, in Europe that uh, sustains the development that we have and, and uses them to answer the important clinical questions. Um, as you of course already knew, uh, we are using the OMOP common data model in the middle of this pipeline. Um, to split the pipeline in ETL part and a an standardized analytics part. And of course, Eden is not inventing a new data model. There is only one data model and that's the OMOP common data model. Uh, and we are, we are using that in the project. We're also helping to improve the model and to help in, in, in improving the vocabularies. And that's of course all done in very close collaboration with the, the Odyssey community. And I myself, I'm also very active in, in Odyssey, um, have been focusing on, on prediction modeling. Um, so there is a very close relationship. It's more like a sister project, I would say. Um, that's also all within the European activities and that's more than only the EDEN project. So I, I very quickly want to point out that there is a, a, a Odyssey Europe uh, initiative and a chapter within the, the global Odyssey community uh, where we are organizing meetings um, like the symposia uh, with training um, and we're really stimulating together with a project like EDEN to uh, to to stimulate the impact and the adoption of the own common data model in Europe. And on the bottom right, you see a couple of bigger projects in Europe that are also using the own common data model and building on top of the network that, uh, that the Eden project is, is creating. That means that we will also have a European Odyssey Symposium uh, and next year it's uh, really exciting because we're going to have that, that meeting at a nice cruise ship in Rotterdam. Uh, also with the aim just to, to increase the adoption of the CDM uh, to create a very nice environment for people to interact and to, to work together to, uh, to make sure that we uh, get better analytical tools and, and, and answer questions that matter to patients. So the Eden project is, is one of the, I think is the biggest project in Europe that's driving the OM of CDM adoption. Uh, it stands for European Health Data and Evidence Network. Uh, the aim is really to build a large federated data network uh, in Europe. And, and of course with federation, we mean that we are not putting all the data together in one central repository, but we keep the data, lo data local and we bring the tools uh, to the data. Um, What's important to know about Eden is that it's not only uh, the kind of informatics question on how do we standardize data, but it's really also about generating evidence. So even though we have to uh, we have to map many databases, the ultimate goal is not the number of databases or the number of patients, but it's really uh, the number of studies that we have run with the network and, and how, how many data sources will be enabled to do that and, uh, and also demonstrated that. 
It's a project uh, uh, funded by a uh, European Commission through the Innovative Medicines Initiative, uh, and that's always together with uh, pharmaceutical industry or FPA and associate partners. And on the right, you see um, the, the organizations that are involved in the Eden project, uh, with on the top, as we call it, the public consortium, which is led by Erasmus Medical Center, with me as the coordinator, and a couple of other organizations like Oxford University and some SMEs, the Hive and Odysseus, uh, that you may have seen in, in Odyssey community as well. Um, and then on the bottom, you see the list of um, pharmaceutical companies that together work uh, in these, uh, these large projects. On the left, you see um, on high level the goals of the Eden project. So first of all, there's the harmonization task that I uh, briefly talked about. Uh, where originally uh, we had to map 100 million anonymized health records to OMOP. Um, we are beyond that. Um, but as I mentioned, that's not really the end goal. It's really, um, it, it, we need it, but uh, we need in the end really run uh, analytical studies and, and, and run studies across the data network. Um, so federation is, is an important component, building the architecture to do that, uh, build the community around that and education, and I'll come back to that uh, in a minute, is also very important because many new people are entering this exciting arena and they need to be trained. They need to understand how the tools work. They need to understand uh, the challenges. And finally, there is a component in Eden which is related to outcomes, uh, outcomes driven healthcare, measuring outcomes, measures, or um, assessing outcomes, measures, I should say, uh, across different databases. As all these bigger projects, uh, the work is divided in different um, you know, work packages. Uh, and here you see the uh, um, the buildup of the Eden project, which is um, uh, created around the concept of drive fuel, of a build fuel and drive, where we have to build something, we have to build infrastructure, we have to fuel that with data and with tools, and then we actually have to drive the project. We have to demonstrate its use. Uh, and those colors uh, you also see in the work packages. So there's a couple of work packages that are developing the workflow on, on generating reliable evidence, one focus on outcome driven healthcare, looking at iTunes standards, uh, and there's a personalized medicine work package that's building some use cases around predictive modeling uh, and, and is driving the development of that. There are, uh, there's also a technical uh, work package that's building tools, and I'll, I'll show a couple of them in my presentation. And then there's a part, uh, Work Package 5, which is extremely important for us. That's creating the view of the system, so that is making sure that um, we have uh, data sources on board. We have small to medium enterprises that can help with, with the mapping. Um, and that's, that's really a core, and I'll, I'll talk more about that as well. And then, of course, there's outreach and sustainability because there's a big challenge with these projects that uh, they, they could die at the end of the funding. And we want to make sure that there is a future for it and that we all the investments that we make are, are worth it. And of course, there's project management uh, in, in projects like, like Eden. Um, now, at the core is the uh, generation of the creation of the data network and Eden has a very unique um, aspect in, in the sense that we have a big harmonization fund, uh, about 17 million euro, that's reserved uh, to map data to the OMA common data model and it's there to, uh, to provide financial support to uh, data partners. Uh, and we do that uh, through open calls. So there are multiple calls per year where data sources can uh, can apply. They fill an application form, um, and there will be an evaluation of those by a committee. And at the end, a list of data sources is selected, and they can all get up to 100,000 euro of funding to map their data. Uh, now, and of course, the data source cannot map the data by by themselves. They need uh, they need support, and that's why we're also building a network of small to medium enterprises, so small companies, that can help these data sources, uh, this, these data partners, to map their data to the OMO common data model. So we've set up a another set of open calls where we invite these companies to get training and and be certified to map to the, uh, the OMO common data model. Um, now that training is, is being supported uh, by an, uh, an online e-learning environment called the Eden Academy, uh, which we've built, and that contains many different types of, um, of courses on the ETL, on the vocabularies, 
uh, but also more uh, advanced studies on prediction and, and, and using the tools like Atlas. Um, and there is a huge amount of interest for that. So I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy with uh, the number of study, number of students that we are currently supporting through the academy. And I'm, I'm 100% sure that this will increase much, much further. I also had a look just how many uh, students from the APEC uh, uh, region are actually in the uh, in the academy, and it's it's very good to see that there are already 150 uh, people that come from the APEC um, countries. So that's great, and I'll, I'll definitely invite you to have a look at this uh, if you're if you haven't seen it. I think it's a very good starting point if ever you're you're new in the community. Um, now we have used this uh, to train the, the SMEs and at the moment we have 47, so close to 50 companies in Europe uh, from 19 different countries that have come through a process where they followed the Eden Academy, uh, but then also had a face-to-face -face meeting uh, before the pandemic, and you see a picture of that in Rotterdam, where we are uh, giving some additional training, but also test these SMEs in their uh, capabilities of mapping to the own common data model. Um, and that has been virtual uh, the last couple of times, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, but it's really exciting to see the interest of all these companies and the fact that they can build up a business around that and, and are working with multiple data partners within the Eden uh, uh, framework, but also outside um, and creating business there. And I think this is a crucial component and also something to consider in the APEC region. You need to have that support network out there to map initially, but also keep them updated and maybe also train people. So we expose all these companies in a service provider directory so uh, people can look up if there's maybe a, an SME in their country and, and this gets this gets updated all the time when new uh, new SMEs are entering the ecosystem. The other uh, point is of course the data. Uh, so we had multiple calls in Eden uh, for financial support uh, and up to now there are 98 data partners from 22 different countries. So very exciting to see this growth. Um, and the, of course, this will create a huge amount of opportunities for us to, uh, to run studies uh, at scale. Um, been within Eden, so we have the component of well, the SMEs and the data, but we're also working on tools and, and building infrastructure. Um, an example is the Eden portal with, with the, the goal to, um, to combine the different individual tools in one environment. So this can this host Atlas and, and Arachne and also the Academy, um, but it also has a catalog um, and you see a uh, screenshot of that here where multiple data sources uh, at the moment there are 26 um, at different stages in, in filling in their their information. Um, but uh, ideally this should contain all the 98 databases when they are ready and, uh, and even more and it would be great to have the full Odyssey community actually in a catalog like this. It has a section where you can find information and more like questionnaire type of information, but there's also an important part which relates to um, actually a, a visualization of the data of aggregated data. Uh, and that is done by running a tool against the common data model and then the result of the tool can be uploaded in this environment and it will automatically then show these type of, uh, of diagrams. In this case, uh, a very high level overview of uh, the age at the first observation or the number of males and females. So for each database, you have the, the fingerprint, the questionnaire, you have some documentation, maybe some reference to literature, and then the database. And in this case, it's the Ipsy database. So I also have a tab on the top, which allows me to upload new versions of this data, and that, that will then be automatically visualized. Um, you can also, of course, do that then across the network. So there is another tab in the, uh, or another menu, in the uh, Eden portal where you can look at the whole network. So now you can see multiple databases that have run this tool. You can see from which country they come. Um, you can even look into the concepts, the, 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 the prevalence or the number of records uh, that are in the database, for example, from diabetes. And you can look across the databases and, and figure out which database would be of interest for a study, um, in this case, for a diabetes study. Um, so this tool is 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 growing. More functionality has been adding. We're looking at security, etc. So it's, this is a whole work package that is focusing on these type of developments. 
Um, there's much more, and because of time, I will not go in depth. There will be other presentations about uh, some of these tools, but we've been working on a tool to assess the quality and research readiness of a data source, which is done with the CDN inspection report that um, tests if uh, the speed of the queries against the database, uh, it, it, it combines output from different sources, from example, the data quality dashboard, um, but also provides an overview of the loaded vocabularies and does all kind of additional checks that uh, ends up in a report. So it automatically generates a Word document that contains all that information in a structured way. Um, and we think that's important. And um, we need this uh, in Eden because the SMEs have to assess the performance of the mapping and we like to do that in a standardized way through a tool um, and that would trigger for the data partner one of the final milestones which means they get paid whenever they pass the CDM inspection so that's a kind of control mechanism that we have put into place. We've also been working on the data quality dashboard uh, from Eden uh, with Claire Blackater in the lead. Um, and we are we're, uh, managing some of the ETL tools and building collaborative map mapping procedures so we can work with multiple people on mapping vocabularies. This is a nice development, I think, to mention here. And of course, there are also multiple new analytical package that's, packages that have been, have been developed. Uh, for example, uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Tom Steine is uh, has built a, a, a pipeline for uh, looking at uh, unstructured text and including the uh, unstructured information into uh, prediction models. We're looking at association rule and frequent pattern mining. Uh, you see here some screenshots of the uh, of the posters that have been presented recently at the OC symposium, so you can find more information there if you're if you're interested. Um, also more, um, yeah, well, other type of method research focusing on uh, comparative effectiveness and safety um, uh, research where we look at heterogeneity of treatment effects. So is the, is the effect the same in different uh, subgroups of, of patients with different risks of the outcome? This is a very interesting and very important topic that uh, uh, Alexandros Rekos uh, is, is leading uh, in our team and is done within, uh, within, the, Eden, uh, within the Eden project. Uh, we're looking at uh, prediction, so looking at the trend of prediction models over time and assessing how well they have been reported. Uh, Cynthia Young has done some nice work on this and is, um, uh, has written a nice publication on that as well. Um, but also more, uh, yeah, more clinical questions on the treatment of patients uh, and the, the treatment patterns. Um, uh, Anik Marcus has done some nice work here, uh, but also then building a R package that you can use against a common data model to execute this study on your own data and, uh, and, and, to, and to ask different types of treatment patterns questions. Um, of course, we've also been involved in, in many different types of, uh, of studies uh, with, with Odyssey. Uh, so this is a, an overview of, of some of the studies that, that people from within Eden have been contributing and sometimes also data sources that we have mapped in Eden are, uh, are involved in these, uh, these studies. And, and I think we should be very proud of this list because I think all these studies have in some way informed the regulator to make uh, important decisions. So this is an example of the power of Odyssey and the power of these, these large type of uh, collaborations. Uh, if we look at the, the, the future uh, of the Eden project, um, I think we are, we are now in ending of clo closing year three of the project. It's it's five and a half years uh, project, uh, so we still have a good amount of time. Um, I think we we will um, definitely well we will soon launch the Eden portal. Uh, we are testing it out internally now, and uh, we'll release that also to give others the opportunity to look at the data catalog and uh, and give feedback on that. And we will during the project continue to update and, and maintain that. Um, there's quite some activity also around uh, research use cases with the data partners. Um, so once they have mapped, finished their mapping, we want to engage them in research. So there's an uh, evidence -thon or ethon principle that we've set up where we bring together some of those new, new data partners uh, with clinical questions and ask them to participate. So they learn how to uh, run an Odyssey uh, study, um, but at the same time also generate important uh, uh, evidence for, for patient care. And of course, we want them to participate in Odyssey network studies and maybe even other types of studies. Could also be commercial studies uh, at some point, uh, of course. Um, we want to make sure that they stay engaged and also keep their data up to date. 
Um, the third very important topic that will still be uh, our focus is promoting uh, Odyssey and community education. Um, so we are thinking about different stakeholder trainings and, and building that it could also be blended training where we have face to face session together with um, the Eden Academy. Um, but I think this is this is very important because we see a, a enormous amount of uptake of Odyssey and OMO principles and uh, also through Eden um, and yeah, these people need to be trained uh, and, uh, and I think um, cannot be the, the small core uh, that is traveling everywhere to uh, to provide training. So we need to do something like train the trainer sessions to get a bigger a bigger group of, of people um, in, you know, investing time in this. And then finally, of course, the even Academy expansion in that context is, is also on the top of our agenda and we are working together with the Odyssey community, but we're also inviting others outside of the Odyssey community more in the clinical domains to provide input on uh, potential uh, trainings within the uh, Eden Academy. And then finally, something that I'm very excited about is that we are la launching an Eden not-for-profit organization uh, with the aim to uh, guarantee the sustainability of all the output that has been created in the project uh, at the end. Um, so that is uh, April 2024. Uh, that's being set up now and it's 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 really a, a nice nice moment to do this because we have already uh, done so much work in creating the network and we are really at the point of executing studies also for people outside of the Eden consortium um, that this is a very logical next step for us and that has uh, full support with it within Eden. Um, we will also be developing like research uh, and kind of research operating model within the Eden not for profit uh, organization and, and future type of business models to sustain that over time. Um, I think this is a this was a nice overview of, of what Eden has been doing and where we are going. Um, of course, there's much, much more to talk about uh, about this project, um, but I would invite you to have a look at the uh, Zenodo uh, environment that contains all publications and also all the deliverables that the Eden project has generated and there's a huge number of, the, uh, of them out there. Um, have a look at that and if there are any questions to us, uh, please use the, uh, the email address here inquiries.eden.au uh, um, and of course follow us on the social media if you want to stay updated uh, about the Eden project. So I hope this was interesting to you and I, I thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Christian Reich. Um, some of you know me. Um, if you don't know me, I have been with Odyssey from the very beginning. I've also been involved in OMOP, the predecessor initiative, and um, um, my focus has been a lot in building the standards and generally supporting the community. Um, and today I want to talk to you about uh, Odyssey and Fire and explain to you what these things are and how they belong together and what it means for you and how you can uh, engage with those initiatives. What are Odyssey and Fire? Are they the same thing? Are they different? Can I do things in Fire that I can do in OMOP? Can I do the things in OMOP that I can do in Fire? And many people uh, have those questions and um, organizations um, even go into uh, exercises where they are comparing the two and deciding um, which way they want to go. Um, that may not be a very good choice because these things are actually in some ways similar and in other ways very different. So let me explain this a little bit. FIRE is a standard that is um, developed by an organization called HL7 or Health Level 7. Has been for quite a while um, um, in, in the making and has reached uh, several levels of maturity or parts of it today. And OMOP, which is the standard that Odyssey uses, also has been in the making for quite a while and, um, and has reached uh, has gone through several iterations and reached uh, maturity. The purpose is slightly different. FIRE um, is a standard for data exchange. Um, OMOP is a standard for large-scale analytics. So let me explain that. Both contain observational data, data 
from patients, clinical data um, that were collected um, during care by various institutions for various purposes. Most of the time, um, electronic health record systems, but could be other systems as well. So we have data from patients or patient data. Both of them represent these. They're structured in resources or domains which are similar aspects, which essentially means a patient has name and the date of birth and sex, and then patients have diseases and patients get treated with drugs or with procedures. Patients seek healthcare in healthcare organizations. All these things are resources or domains in OMOP speak. They are standardized through profiles and they are standardized through a common data model with vocabularies. So both of them standardize the way the patient data are represented. That makes them similar, and this is why people think, well, you know, I, I should be using, what, which one should I be using, FHIR or OMOP? But there's also a difference, and it will become very obvious um, why you would want to pick one over the other, depending on what you're trying to do. FHIR is for one patient at a time. It is to demonstrate a patient record, a transaction. Something happens to this patient, and typically, the transaction is between one healthcare provider, a doctor or a nurse, to another. So imagine a patient goes, is referred to a hospital, goes from the uh, ambulatory uh, doctor's office uh, and is sent in with the ambulance into the hospital. And the hospital wants to see the details of the patient. That's the idea. You see that patient in a standardized fashion. Um, it contains all sorts of things, the, the, the events and activities that happened, but also the events and activities as they occur and as they are organized. So there are orders and schedules and all these kind of things. It is optimized for viewing by the provider. So the idea is give the provider the necessary information to understand what's going on with the patient. That's fire. OMOP has different purpose, different use cases. It is for many patients, it's for populations. It's not built for individual patient care. It only contains the facts. It doesn't contain all the things that happen in order for these facts to occur. So no orders, no schedules, no appointments, nothing. Only what happened. And it is optimized for large scale analytics, not for viewing by an individual healthcare provider. Large scale analytics need the data to be in such a way that they can be easily um, um, queried and then uh, utilized in statistical methods. So that's the difference, which is why these things actually aren't alternatives, they are complementing each other. So you want to have FHIR and OMOP. And the organizations, HO7 and Odyssey, who are responsible for these standards, realized that and um, late 2020 came together and started uh, conversations about why don't we bring these together and integrate? Because we have many use cases that are legitimate, legitimate use cases for FHIR and we have many use cases which are legitimate use cases for OMOP and people struggle because they, they end up being in the wrong system for their use case. That led to a agreement between the organization to integrate the two um, standards. And the press release came out in May, um, which essentially declares that HL7 International and Odyssey is starting a collaboration to provide a single common data model for sharing information in care and research. So that doesn't quite mean that everybody's going to throw away the existing standards, the FHIR and the OMOP standards, but that the, 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 eventually the goal is that you have an integrated system where you can, um, where you can support either use case. So why would we do this? What are these use cases? 
that we would that we want to uh, uh, integrate and where we want essentially fire users to make make it something happen for using OMOP use cases and the other way around. I'm going to show you a few of these examples. These are ideas. So here again is um, so then, uh, 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 graph by, by Paul. Um, it shows how they how close they already are and how well they map. Which is really sp it speaks for the idea of. If we could make these things jive with each other, lots of good things could happen because the logic fits. Populations of, um, corresponds to a cohort. Attributes exist in either side. There's some work to do to, to map them. Data models exist on either side. Value sets or concept sets exist on either side. Terminologies exist on either side. So many of the Lego bricks are the same. So if we have Lego bricks that are the same, what we could do is make sure that content can flow from one to the other. So if you have a fire client, you could take the data in the fire client and make them show up as in an OMOP CDM instance and the other way around. If we had such an such a nice piece of alchemy here where we could go from one to the other, what would happen? Well, the first thing is you could apply each other's tools. Fire has a whole cottage industry um, of tools. There is a smart app um, application where lots of people do all sorts of uh, interesting tools that use data in Fire. And all of, of course, has the Odyssey methods, Atlas and Hades and all these other things, which are geared towards large scale analytics, very powerful methods. You could harmonize a semantic space, so you could actually declare what these things are that you're talking about. This is important for, the, for example, for cancer, where the community is struggling to neatly and unequivocally identify what the things are that we're talking about. You could define quality metrics. Essentially, you have patients, convert them into OMOP, and you have uh, the very powerful cohort definitions that you have in, on the OMOP side, which then can result in reports, depending on whether or not these patients fall into the quality cohorts in this case or not. You could do decision support systems. You could take the patients that you have in fire and run them through a, pa a patient level prediction system that will then allow you to support um, decisions on, on the EHR side. You can do predictive modeling with this and you can do clinical trial recruitment. Again, the same idea as usual as always. You have patients in fire, you convert them to OMOP. In OMOP, you describe the, pep, the population that you want. And OMOP is very powerful at that because it needs it for its uh, population-based methods. And then you bring it back into the fire and identify the patients um, that are member of the cohorts. You can build knowledge graphs. And again, each of these, these are not my ideas. These are people, uh, this is what people um, are proposing to do. And, um, and have detected uh, opportunities for, for value generation. There are other models, just not just FIRE and OMOP. Um, there's a PICORNET, I2B2 and ACT, BRIDGE, CDISC, SENTINEL. Right now, what we have is a wool ball of many-to-many -many conversions, and it's a very um, unsatisfying situation. Fire has been decided to be the common language by a um, by a uh, FDA project called Common Data Model Harmonization, run by Mitra Rocker. And so, instead of having an all-to-all, -all, you could have a spider web um, uh, model where Fire is the the, the common uh, um, language. But of course. One of the two we are already talking about, which would be then OMOP to Fire Connector. 
You could do regulatory submissions. The FDA is thinking about having their submissions be in fire instead of in what's currently um, what's currently being done, either non-structured uh, or in, in predecessor structures that exist today. Um, and these submissions can be then used in an analytical uh, um, environment. You can do disease surveillance system, sometimes that with the corona pandemic has become much more on people's minds, where you look at um, um, on the fire side on on a program called Risk Space Escape, uh, where you can visually analyze and, uh, and, and look at the disease outbreaks. And again, in OMOP, you could create analytical databases for large scale analytics out of these things, which today is very, very hard to do and always done manually. And of course, all of this needs to be done at scale. So instead of what we usually have, where individual groups uh, decide that they want to harmonize and they, they build their own manual little tools and, and processes, we want to have a way for this to become a common good. So if you're a fire client, it's very easy to go to an OMOP instance and the other way around. These are the plans. Um, lots of uh, ideas um, um, and uh, we have to fill life into it. And since this collaboration really just started, we had in August a kickoff meeting. That's all. Um, we uh, this is at the beginning, and of course you are invited to participate uh, in this uh, journey, in this endeavor, and help. So, where and how do you find this, and where what what do you do? There's a confluence page, and there's Zulip. So we, I'm coming from the Odyssey side. We're using um, other methods for communication, but very similar ones, but we had to decide which side we go. So we use the uh, infrastructure that uh, HL7 has built. It's equivalent, equally um, easy to use, um, but may not be, may not, may be a little bit uh, a learning curve for the Odyssey community to get used to slightly different tools. So instead of Teams, you talk and chat and exchange information in Zulip, and instead of um, Wiki, we use Confluence in this particular program. There is a Confluence homepage that shows everything that you need to know about it, and that is also the the landing page from where you want to go uh, uh, to where you where you're interested in participating. Um, so there's all sorts of reference material if you want to know what's being said and done, um, what other people have done prior art before. So lots of people have thought about the interconnectivity between fire and OMA beforehand. Um, you will find this here. Um, you'll see what the organizing committee is talking about and how they're trying to move this forward. Everything is transparent. But of course, the important pieces are the projects and use cases that are uh, the, um, worked on by the subgroups. Okay. And right now we have five subgroups. The data model harmonization, fire OMOP digital quality measurement, fire OMOP oncology use case, registries and other applications, and fire and OMOP terminology subgroup. The terminology subgroup is really a sub subgroup because they are needed for the uh, data model harmonization and of course also for oncology. And so, and the harmonization is a subgroup of the, the data quality and the oncology. So really, there's even a little bit of a hierarchy in here. Um, but what we do is uh, we're going to have these subgroups talk to each other uh, and um, and interact and make sure that they know of each other's priorities and timing and so on and so on. So you can click on them, read about it, and then you can easily sign up and come in. Um, there is a sign up. A page, you just put in your name, which one, and then you're going to be contacted and you're going to get all the necessary details and the invitations um, and all this kind of stuff. Um, right now, these subgroups meet with something like every two weeks or so or month um, uh, cadence. Um, some subgroups have split themselves into different uh, hemispheres to make it easier for the 
uh, for our friends from the Asian side, you guys, to participate. Others have not done that. Please tell them if you are from Asia that you need to, that meetings shouldn't be in the middle of your night. People will accommodate, but they may not know where you're coming from. So um, you have to understand that, you know, not everybody knows everybody uh, and uh, their geographic location. Um, but this is definitely a global activity and we expect this to have traction um, anywhere in the world and people who want to participate will be able to do that. We talk again in Zulip. I just opened the, the one of the pages. So there's a there's all sorts of other talk, of course, in HL7. This is HL7's uh, 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 chatterbox. Um, and there's a page for OMOB and FIRE with a whole lot of sub, um, with, with the subgroups in there. And, you know, they, they exchange information, they debate things, just like we are doing in the, um, in the Odyssey um, forum. What's next? The groups are starting up. They're trying to figure out what they are and who's going to do what and what needs to be done. We're going to have another meeting on uh, 8th of December where we see what happened and what the plans are and what the ideas are. And then the groups will work again. And then the first thing where we want to put things to test is what HL7 calls a connectathon. Um, in Odyssey, we have the idea of hackathons or studyathons. Similar, similar idea, except here, what we want to do is we want to demonstrate that we can take data from one um, uh, camp and make it useful in in a in a in an uh, um, uh, actual use case on the other side. So to connect the the, the two um, uh, sides to each other with real data and real applications. So we're going to have a big. Um, uh, so this is going to be require a lot of preparation, of course, so that it'll work in May. So expect it to be a little bit like a little bit of mixture between a study thon and an Odyssey symposium, um, but it, it will be very hands on and people are going to have to show that it works and demonstrate um, during that connectathon. That's really all I, I wanted to say. We're at the beginning of a journey. We need your help. Um, so we expect some of you to be more engaged, some of you to be just waiting until things happen. We want to have artifacts which will make it very easy for you to utilize fire and OMOP and the other way around. Um, and we, you know, within a reasonable time frame, a couple of years or so, um, we that we can declare uh, that the two um, uh, um, standards are reasonably harmonized to support the use cases so we can go to the next stage uh, of integration and make them even closer, uh, bring them even closer together. Thank you very much. So during COVID-19, uh, we showed the benefit of open science that we can promote the citizens' participation in the science, and we can promote they can uh, we can facilitate the belief, uh, uh, facilitate that citizens can believe in science because they can see uh, transparently what we are doing and the uh, we share all the results um, by using interactive websites. So again, uh, this can uh, promote the belief in science, which is really important in. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So yeah, so I think those have been very important in uh, in how we deal with the the COVID pandemic. Uh, in that we've been able to, uh, as a community, be able to respond very quickly uh, to very important questions that that uh, regulators, for example, had. Uh, and I think also because of the open science, we were able to. Uh, um, generate a lot of trust in what we're doing. It wasn't just uh, one or two persons in one location uh, doing this behind closed doors. We were all doing it out in the open, very transparent. And so um, I'm convinced it had a very big impact in, in what we could do as a community. Yeah, so I think that we were able to, to demonstrate the power of our community and, and 
the expertise that we have and all the tools that we we have to standardize the process it really it really meant that we were able to excel where a lot of, of researchers were struggling um, and i think that was another exciting part of the, the pandemic is that it gave us the opportunity to to show um all the great work that we've been doing over the last few years i think that that concept is extremely important i mean looking at the uh covid study -athon that happened Right. Even during the first 88 hours of it, there was so much evidence and so much knowledge that was shared amongst the folks. Um, and it goes uh, it goes with our philosophy of open source and sharing of that knowledge. Right. Because there's COVID was so new. A lot of people didn't understand it. A lot of people didn't know what to expect or how to even do the research. So putting all the brain power of all these experts and specialty specialists in all the different areas, in the data, in the uh, coding of it, in the epidemiology of it, in the methods of it, really helped show how a community can quickly come together to gather evidence and make that evidence, you know, reflect what is going on in reality and in life, right? And be able to help people gain insights really quickly into uh, a disease that just popped up on us. I don't know how we would have done it without the open nature of our community. Um, being able to share code, share analyses, um, you know, work through problems together, um, just accelerated the experience and gave us, I think, a more shared collective confidence that we were doing the right things were possible. Odyssey definitely embodies a sense of community. And during the COVID pandemic, it was something that should be forefront for all organizations, regulatory bodies, um, academic institutions. It really uh, showed us that we needed to be transparent, we needed to be open, and we needed to communicate. Because the COVID pandemic not only affected um, people, it was a worldwide pandemic, and we all really needed to work together. And this was a great uh, show of how the community already had the open source tools, the people and the, the community to help support this uh, academic exercise. Well, open science has been around for a really, really long time. I think I looked it up and it's like the 1940s, but I think Odyssey as a community has honed it. And we were the first ones to really tackle how to do global collaboration virtually, which is a non-trivial part of COVID collaboration. And we have become very nimble and very agile in both our ability to generate quick results and react. We have a really amazing brain trust that has rapidly kind of iterated on all of the tenets of how we structure our research process, which is really important for collaboration, knowing what direction we're going in together. So we're not all running to different parts of the map. And I think that as a community, it just added more fire to something that was working really well. And we're just very fortunate that we had a few years of practice doing some, you know, like intramurals, like softball style uh, team science. And then the big leagues came around and we're like, don't worry guys, we got this. And I'm really, really proud to see us get promoted to the big leagues and continue to just knock it out of the park. So when facing a new disease like COVID, it's such important to have a collaboration like Odyssey, um, where we can gather um, people from the world around, um, with epidemiologists, statisticians, and clinicians, and um, all, everyone could contribute their talents to the study designs and also statistical analysis and other parts of our studies on COVID-19 vaccine. I think this is really important for um, to, to, for generating evidence um, in the COVID-19 uh, study. Well, the community is really crucial to make progress, and that has been demonstrated in the COVID-19 study a -thon, right? We had so many parallel activities uh, within the Teams environment that we've set up, um, and, and that, that's, that's really, really, really exciting. On the other hand, the open source really enables us to, to, to work on tools together, build them together, improve them um, quite easily. And so there's a very quick, um, quick turnaround of new ideas into tools, which is really facilitating a lot of research, I would say. COVID-19, as opposed to all other research questions, really pressed us and all of the researchers to deliver um, some answers quickly. And that led to a lot of public publications that were 
uh, of a suboptimal quality. And I think that having a community here actually helped us a lot to make sure that we produce robust evidence. Because I can just recall us sitting together and looking at our results or diagnostics and figure out what went wrong. And I think as opposed to other researchers, we really took our time as a community to ensure that we do have robust evidence. And then it cannot live without open science because how else would you ensure that your code is reproducible and that you can share openly what you discovered and that other people can check your results? This is all by the virtue of open science. I think community and open science is really important during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially to improve transparency and reliability of evidence. And I think that working groups are a great way in which Odyssey allows for more collaboration and allows for open conversation between colleagues.
Right, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Nicole Pratt, and I'm the president of the Odyssey Australia chapter. And it's my pleasure to be sharing with you some of the exciting activities of our chapter um, and our achievements over the last year. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. For me, it's the Karuna people of the Adelaide Plains, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So to recap, our um, goals were to increase the number of data sets in Australia that have been mapped to the OMOP CDM and to work as a community to make our learnings in terms of vocabulary, um, mappings available in um, open source formats. So we aim to contribute to the Odyssey community through collaborations with specific work groups, so the data quality, the oncology work group and the vocabulary work group. And importantly, given some of the successes we've had in achieving database translations, we aim to contribute more to network studies and even lead one of our own network studies. So in terms of some of the database translations that we've achieved, um, we've made some great progress actually, not only in the number of data sets um, that we've translated, but also in the breadth of the data. So we've got examples of primary care databases in New South Wales and Victoria and nationally that are being translated. And we have multiple data sets, um, hospital EMR data sets uh, in progress. And we've made significant progress towards translating large national claims databases as well. So here's some um, examples of the data sets that are in various stages of translations. Um, so here, uh, I've just mucked that up. Let me start that again. <laughs> okay. Um, so some of the examples of the translations that have occurred in Australia include this patron um, primary care research network repository of 1.5 million patients, which has been completed just recently and is now in the final um, testing phase. So this data repository um, has used the APAC hypertension study as a test case to understand um, how their translation has gone um, and have been successful in running that um, network study. The same group from the University of Melbourne are also now looking at converging, converting the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre data hub into OMOP and that's due to commence uh, this month and the first data set for that one will be the emergency department admissions. So next is another primary care data repository called the Medicines Insight, um, which has just started the ETL design process. So this project has been led by Tang Liao and is really delving into the data quality assessment and cost effectiveness of the CDM enabled approach, um, which will be great to use as a showcase uh, to promote translation of other EMRs uh, here in Australia. Um, there's also another project that's aiming to improve surveillance infrastructure for Indigenous primary health care by converting Aboriginal community controlled uh, health services data into the OMOP uh, common data model. So that's a really exciting project that's just now in the planning stages. So there's also been lots of progress in the translation of hospital EMR data, which has been converted to OMOP with hospital data in Cerner based data warehouses um, in various stages of completion in Queensland, um, Queensland health data, which is started and scheduled for 2022 is the Austin Health in Melbourne um, and Western Health in Melbourne as well. Um, and a pilot study is ongoing uh, with an epic instance um, of data in the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Um, so this data uh, project is, is a large one across Australia. Um, it's really um, looking at how we can develop and validate use cases um, on these hospital EMR data sets. And last but not least, we've made some good project progress in translating national claims data um, with national pharmaceutical dispensing data sets converted and we're well on the way um, to completing the Australian Department of Veterans Affairs uh, data sets. And there's been lots of ongoing work on harmonisation efforts across the states, looking at um, data sets in the data linkage units and how we might convert those uh, to the OMOP CDM. Um, and I'm also scoping some of the clinical cancer registries or the clinical orthopaedic registries here in Australia and opportunities um, for translation of those data sets. And I'd just like to um, give a shout out to the team at the University of New South Wales who've been working towards developing their ETL framework for 
conversion of health databases. Um, this framework reads mapping logic for OMOP tables from YAML files and then organises SQL snippets um, to define ETL logic to populate the OMOP um, columns. So if you want to know more about this novel framework, um, please you know, check out this MedArchive um, publication from Juan Kuros, who has given us a presentation uh, at our Odyssey Australia um, symposium seminar, and the link is available here, or you can have a look on the Odyssey Australia website um, and check out the great work that's happening there in the University of New South Wales. So next, um, our aim was to contribute to the Odyssey community work groups, um, and I'll tell you just a bit about the work that's been ongoing uh, in those different areas. So the first I've um, spoken about this before, the White Bandicoot tool um, has been developed um, by the University of Melbourne. Um, and this is software that enables data quality um, of the Australian data warehouses to be assessed. Um, and against the international standard can harmonise framework. And importantly, um, this tool helps to understand the data quality uh, of data, not only converted data, but of the source data set itself. Um, and the White Bandicoot tool is currently being tested um, and will be ready for external uh, use, hopefully, uh, later this year. Okay, so as I mentioned, the team uh, in Sydney are working with the Oncology Extension Workgroup through their CARVA uh, research infrastructure program, um, which is aiming to integrate clinical cancer care data from oncology information systems with hospital EMRs into research ready frameworks. And in particular, um, they've been converting the open access repositories of cancer treatment protocols into computable forms that can be represented in a NOMOP extension. Uh, and again, if anyone wants to learn more about this, they can jump onto the the Odyssey Australia website, where there is a link to a webinar um, by Tim Churches and his team on the Carver project. Um, so it's another really exciting project, um, helping with the infrastructure uh, of Odyssey and the use in Australia. Um, so we've also been doing lots of work trying to uh, help bring together all of the vocabularies uh, across Australia, um, working with ARDC on the development of Research Terminologies Australia project or the Rosetta project. And we're really trying to um, come together and share uh, the curation of multiple custom medical terminologies um, and mappings and phenotypes here in Australia. Okay, so last, um, section is really to talk about our goals in and how we've achieved those goals in international research study studies and in particular um, initiating at least one network study. So I'm going to propose um, two research studies that we might work together on as a community in APAC. So we've participated in lots of different network studies across the collaboration. Um, we've participated in the Odyssey APAC research study on hypertension. Um, we've participated in the EMEA study, which looks at um, evaluation of methods for vaccine safety. We're participating in the inflammatory bowel disease characterization study and identifying data sets that could potentially participate in the legend type 2 diabetes mellitus study. Okay, so here are the proposed network studies um, from Odyssey Australia, uh, and I'm going to work, walk through both of them now. So we've got the first study proposal is around the real world safety of treatments for multiple sclerosis. So there's two parts to that particular question, and the first is around the utilisation patterns and treatment pathways for treatments in multiple sclerosis. And second is to really understand the risk of serious infections or virus reactivations um, in patients who are treated with biologic medicines. So why this study? Well, multiple sclerosis prevalence varies widely across the world and the prevalence has been increasing. Um, and it's been identified that the APAC region um, in particular um, has very poor surveillance of MS and there are many evidence gaps. So we also know that there's been somewhat of an explosion in disease modifying therapies for multiple sclerosis and treatment patterns are many and they're varied between the different regions. So here, for example, are the treatment pathways that have been published um, from a data set in the US. Um, and here's um, the same uh, analysis done in, in Australia. And you can see that the treatment pathways are quite different. Um, and in Australia, 
we're using some of the really high efficacy treatments earlier in the treatment pathway compared to the US. So why is that important? Well, there's evidence to uh, suggest that aggressive treatment for MS is effective. However, this might be offset by some safety issues. And secondly, the complex treatment patterns means that outcome assessment is going to be pretty tricky and it's likely that cumulative effects of um, prior treatments may impact on the effectiveness and the safety um, of subsequent treatments. So there's potential opportunity to attack this program with some more sophisticated um, cumulative exposure methodologies, um, which I think would be lots of fun. Okay, so the second proposed uh, study is to look at the risk of periprosthetic infection among patients with joint replacements who are exposed to biologic medicines. Um, and again, there's two parts to this study. The first is really to understand the utilisation patterns of biologics prior to patients undergoing joint replacement. And the second is to understand the risks of post-surgical periprosthetic infection in patients exposed to these biologic treatments. Um, for example, denosumab or BDMARDS for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so why is this study important? So we first know um, that the rates of joint replacement uh, procedures have been increasing all over the world, really. Uh, here's an example of the increase, um, projected increase in uh, joint replacement in Australia. And the bottom here is the increase in joint replacement in the US. So there's been um, increasing use of this particular treatment. Um, we also know that there's been an increased use of uh, biologics in patients. Um, there's been no data, at least that I could find, that uh, does the characterisation study of biologics in joint replacement. However, um, population rates are increasing, so it's possible um, that they're also increasing in joint replacement. And third, we know um, that post-operative infection rates are increasing despite many efforts to try to mitigate this risk. Um, so understanding the potential for post-surgical infection in immunocompromised patients is potentially a really important public health question, um, particularly as joint replacement surgery uh, increases and outcomes of revision surgery uh, for infection are generally very poor. Right, so they're my two pictures um, for studies that we can work together on as an APAC community. Um, and if anybody in the audience is not already a member of Odyssey Australia and would like to become involved, jump on our website um, and join up. We'd love to have you. Right, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Lei Liu. I'm from Finland University. Uh, I will be uh, presenting Odyssey uh, China chapter uh, today. So uh, first, I'd like to uh, uh, briefly introduce uh, the Odyssey China chapter. Um, this chapter established on December in December uh, 2016 by Hua Xu, and now we have four co-chairs: Hua Xu, myself, and uh, Professor Hui Lu, and Professor Yi Zhou. And there are more than 300 participants uh, for, from uh, academic, government, and the industry in China. And we uh, uh, have uh, subgroups. Uh, one is uh, focused on clinical studies, and one is uh, on tools building and terminology, and another one is uh, for training and promoting. And uh, last year, we uh, um, made a big effort to translate the Odyssey book into Chinese. And there are more than 90 volunteers and contributed to this book. And the next, I would like to uh, present some activities we have done um, for the past year and, and this year. Um, so first of all, um, we have a study try to map the, IC, the ICD-10 Chinese version to uh, SNOMED. And so this work um, is led by me and also uh, uh, Hong Na um, from a digital uh, health, China Digital Health. And in this year's MedInfo will present a paper uh, about this study. Uh, it's a cross-language terminology mapping between SAD-10 Chinese and SNOMED. And so we, we made uh, quite a bit of effort and uh, we tried to uh, map uh, the vocabularies to the OMAP standards, uh, including the conditions, the procedures, and drug uh, measurements. So um, there was, for the conditions, there were more than uh, 34,000 uh, Chinese terms being mapped. And then for the procedures, there's more than 13,000 terms mapped. 
and for the drugs, there's more than 41,000 terms uh, mapped. Um, so that's the, um, the the terminology vocabulary work we have uh, we have done for the for the past year. And also we uh, divide uh, deployed the tools. This tool is, uh, uh, is developed by Hua Xu and the team, uh, his team, and and this this tools help us to for you know during this mapping work to try to map the Chinese uh, vocabularies into uh, 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 the English vocabularies. And also we uh, did uh, some training works. Uh, and this is uh, uh, led by uh, uh, Professor Yi Zhou from uh, Shenzhen University. And they have the first clinical research and health informatics forum. And they will continue to have the, uh, to make an, a new one uh, next year as well. OK, so now it's the plan for the 2022 for, for our chapter. And we're going to first we're going to continue uh, to work on this uh, um, vocabulary mapping uh, project. Um, for the past year, you know, we have done um, maybe half of the work. You can see from this table, uh, some of the terms have been mapped and some of them still uh, lag behind and some of them uh, haven't started yet. So we're going to start try to map um, as, as, much, as many as possible to map the Chinese terms into the uh, SNOMAD CT, also to the OMAP standards as well. So. And also we uh, have proposed uh, four clinical studies from three universities. Um, first is uh, from Fudan University, which uh, I'm going to lead the project. And then the second is from a Hong Kong University uh, Medical School. And, and the other two, the last two is from the Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So the first study uh, is more on the um, hepatic surgical studies using OMAP CDM. So we have in uh, Fudan University uh, affiliate uh, Zhongshan Hospital, um, we have collected a, a quite large uh, cohort data on the uh, hepatic um, carcinoma data. And so we right now we are mapping and also transform and uh, data into the OMAP CDM. Uh, and then we're going to try to answer uh, the list of uh, some example question, clinical questions. For example, um, the surgical resection and the local non-surgical therapies for this uh, uh, liver cancer, you know, uh, the large scale, the survival analysis. We can, we can do some some studies like that using this kind of data. So that's the, this work uh, uh, will be conducted in my group and so associated with uh, uh, Zhongshan Hospital's uh, uh, group, the physicians. OK, the second product uh, is proposed by uh, Hong Kong University's medical school uh, is by Ian Wang, Shirley Li and uh, uh, Tian Tian Ma. So it's a study on COVID-19 and they're going to monitor and evaluate short Med, uh, medium and long-term mortality and uh, uh, morbidity, morbidity following COVID-19 infections. So they, they're going to look at the, the patient, uh, the outcomes, and also the post-infections for the specific populations, including children, elderly, and people with some, uh, multiple uh, chronic diseases. So this is their study uh, designs. They have a core core studies using the multinational uh, healthcare data, uh, I guess not only from Hong Kong, from other part of uh, the world. And the data source also from, is not a, a multinational. And, and the, the population is all uh, about the COVID-19 uh, positive, the positive diagnosis uh, diagnosed. And the follow up, the short term is uh, about three months. The medium term is about three months to one year, and the long term is uh, beyond one year. And the third uh, study um, proposed by uh, Professor Hui Lu from uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, they're going to study the uh, multimodal and uh, multicenter causal infection uh, in inference of uh, hypertension. So this is their their study design, and they they more from the um, the case report and also the the incorporate uh, the knowledge base uh, of the disease and then try to infer some causal factors uh, for the hypertension. 
And the last study actually is a joint study between uh, Funan University and Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Um, it's going to be led by uh, uh, Hui Lu and, uh, and myself, and also um, uh, Professor Yu uh, from the uh, Children's Hospital, Shanghai Children's Hospital. So this study is trying to build a rare disease standardized uh, data set. So, um, so we're going to use the OMAP model uh, and also try to standardize to map the uh, rare disease vocabularies into the, uh, the OMAP model standards and to build Chinese um, rare disease uh, database. And we identified about 121 uh, different uh, rare diseases and try to collect the, the data uh, for those uh, 121 uh, diseases. OK, so that's all the studies uh, uh, we plan to do uh, in uh, 2022. And of course, there may be more. So as, as the time goes, there are more people may propose more, more, um, more studies as well. Um, that's all I would like to, to talk about. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tatsuo Hiramatsu from Odyssey Japan. I'm going to talk about our activities in short today. Vocabulary mapping. Mapping is where we focus most. For conditions, uh, strategy is mapping via exchange code, which is coded as one code, one disease concept, so that it can be the pivot for mapping among different code systems, like Japan Claims Code and Japan Standard Disease Name Code. Current status is almost done, although granularity is close. For drug, a strategy is starting with level of ingredient because it can be mapped reliably. reliably. Current status is done with ingredient level. We also have fine granularity T1 but it is not correct in some areas and need to be verified. For laboratory test, strategy is narrowing down to less than 100 items and mapping them manually. The table will be expanded as needed later. Current status is already listed based on frequency and commonality. We are going to uh, we are hoping to include uh, these vocabularies in Athena. Next is monthly meeting. We have regular monthly meeting usually around each of months, uh, each of end of each of months. Uh, this year we had topics like Odyssey basics, Odyssey research paper introduction, how to build Odyssey environment and Japanese standard vocabulary mapping strategy. The archive of materials can be found here, uh, but sorry, all in Japanese. A trust in a class. Um, this is just for reference. I'm going to give a class that uses a class for exercise two. The class is for learning medical research design and the aim of that day is to practice the procedure of medical big data analysis in a simple way by using Atlas. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Feng here from the National University of Singapore, or you may also call me Morning. I'll be representing the Odyssey Singapore chapter today. First, please let me quickly recap the uh, birth of a very new chapter. The Singapore chapter was only set up uh, in 2020. So this is kind of a second year into uh, this journey. We have been keeping our community as an open and learning community, and therefore we have been gathering more and more partners and, uh, and members into our uh, chapter. This year, we are very glad to see some of our Singapore uh, researchers have already been involved and contributing to both our APEC and global symposiums, contributing as organizers or instructors in tutorials and workshops. So uh, our chapter, uh, together with me, uh, Dr. Dr. Niam is also the co-chair, and we also set our website to allow 
our members to find out uh, more information about the ongoing studies and also to share the studies are ongoing in APEC and also globally in the forum. Now let's uh, quickly uh, share with you uh, the, the data that we have mapped to Odyssey in Singapore. There are many ongoing efforts in multiple uh, hospitals and healthcare institutes in Singapore. And here are two most mature and, and well-finished projects. Uh, one comes from our Kutik Park Hospital uh, with, with the effort from our colleagues from HSA, uh, full name Health Science Authority, they have mapped uh, the inpatient electronic medical records of over 290,000 patients from 2010 to 2016. Also, uh, my team has been working also with Kutik Park Hospital in mapping a 5,000 type 2 diabetes uh, patient electronic medical record data into OMOP CDM as well. But different from the previous EHR data set, uh, for the T2DM data set, uh, we have both the outpatient visits and inpatient visits for this uh, type 2 diabetes cohort, um, while most of the patients have been follow up for more than five years. While on the other hand, uh, our National University Health System, uh, effort mainly led by my co-chair, Dr. Niam, has also managed to map over 750,000 inpatient electronic medical record data to OMOP CDM. Um, and the patient were admitted between 2015 and 2019. While also for my lab, uh, we, we map again and 10,000 uh, type 2 diabetes cohort. Same thing with both their outpatient and inpatient visits uh, with five years of follow ups. Uh, from NUHS as well. Well, besides these two hospitals, uh, more exciting news is that we managed to, to convince our Ministry of Health uh, to adopt uh, Odyssey OMOP CDM pretty much as the national standard to integrate data from multiple public institutes in Singapore. And therefore, besides our National University Health System, the other two public healthcare cluster, namely the Sing Health and National Health Group, are also ongoing in mapping their data into OMOP CDM. In addition to that, we also have a, a very long going and uh, very well established cohort managed by our Agency for Science, Technology and Research, in short, ASTAR, uh, uh, also mapping their cohort data into OMOP CDM. And this cohort is called the GASTO cohort, uh, which has been following up over 10 years on our pregnant women and their children, aiming to, to study how nutrition, how behaviors may change the health of both pregnant women and children. As I mentioned, all these partners are already ongoing, have uh, uh, consistent investments and ongoing efforts in mapping their data to Odyssey uh, CDM. While well, with all these uh, uh, data mapping and ETL effort going, uh, last year uh, has been quite a fruitful year for us as well uh, uh, as the study outcomes. We have published an article in the Applied Clinical Informatics uh, a journal under AMIR, summarizing uh, some of the challenges and the uh, invented mapping tools we have injected while we map our type 2 diabetes cohort uh, from the Kutik Park Hospital and also the uh, NUH as healthcare cluster. Also, our colleagues from the uh, HSA has also been publishing, has published an article sharing their very valuable experience in transforming the electronic medical records uh, to OMOP CDM and also uh, more importantly highlighting the real benefits uh, from that as well. While we also involved involve in the uh, APEC hypertension study that uh, I think all our Asian Pacific uh, chapters are involved last year, uh, we're very glad to learn that our paper already went through two rounds of review by the Drama Open Network. And we do uh, hope to see it uh, being published uh, shortly, either within this year or early next year. While inspired by such a fruitful year uh, in 2021, uh, here are two of the studies that we, we are proposing that we hope to study in the next two years. And the first one, again, is focusing on type 2 diabetes patients. I think you probably already noticed that uh, Singapore, we are very serious about type 2 diabetes. And, and uh, if you have been following the news um, in before COVID in 2019, our health minister actually has declared an official war against diabetes because our school has uh, estimated that if we, do, we are not going to do anything now by 2050, a quarter of Singaporeans will be suffering to type 2 diabetes. And therefore, 
Uh, besides fighting the pandemic, our Ministry of Health also still been investing huge amount of research efforts in addressing various issues around surrounding type 2 diabetes. And in particular for this study, we're, we're aiming to build a predictive model to predict the time for the next hospital admission for a type 2 diabetes patient and also the potential cause for it. Well, this study is, is motivated by the observation is that there are indeed some uh, hospital admission risk prediction models out there in the literature. Ho however, uh, most of these models just predict the risk or likelihood that this may happen, but seldom that there's a model can estimate when exactly this is going to happen and what causes may cause the patient to be admitted, uh, which we find is more meaningful for any uh, preventive interventions. And therefore, we like to leverage on multi-center data and also all the brain power from all the data scientists from various regions to build a predictive model to allow us to estimate the time in months or even as accurate in weeks for the next potential hospital admission for type 2 diabetes patients and the potential cause. But a disclaimer, uh, I'm, I'm trained in computer scientists and I'm not clinical trained. So in case I miss any clinical details, please refer to uh, our URL here for a detailed write-up or study. And also you may scan the QR code here as well, which will also guide you to our write-ups about this study. Well, on the second study, we changed the gear a little bit and now focus on patients who suffer from uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, in particular, patients who has gone uh, undergone uh, PCI. Right. The, motiva the motivation of this study is that uh, patients who have undergone PCI will commonly be taking uh, antiplatelet therapies. Right? Uh, uh, commonly is uh, uh, clobidogrel to prevent resurgence of uh, myocardial infections. However, some studies uh, also found that common genetic variations among Eastern Asians may affect actually the efficacy of uh, clobidogrel. And in addition to that, it's also known that uh, PBI inhibitors, for example, uh, omeprazole, can also affect the efficacy of uh, clobidogrel. However, the, the interesting thing is that we observe from our data that still a large proportion of our patients in, in our hospital uh, were still taking both medication at the same time. And, and therefore, we would like to conduct a data-driven, again, hopefully a multi-center investigation to first uh, investigate the efficacy uh, of the uh, clobidogrel on Eastern Asian populations. And more importantly, uh, to generate some data-driven evidence to, to quantify to the effect of the usage of uh, opiprazole on the, the treatment effectiveness of uh, clobidogrel as well. And again, as I mentioned, uh, I'm not clinically trained, so in case I miss anything, please again refer to our URL and the QR code here. Right. So uh, there will be a voting about the, the, uh, the best study to, to, to undertake for the Asian Pacific uh, chapters next year. Hope uh, all of you may vote for us. Well, besides these two, two studies, uh, we like also like to be more engaging in the community uh, activities uh, next year. Uh, to be begin with, uh, as I mentioned, we will still keep our chapter as an open and welcoming community for anyone uh, all the researchers in Singapore are willing to, to learn or interested to learn about Odyssey or more CDMs to join us. And we'll continue to be the breeze to connect all our researchers to all the learning opportunities and also research opportunities, opportunities in both the APEC and global Odyssey uh, ecosystem. Uh, in particular, we aim to participate in at least two global legend studies next year. And, and uh, a, a good start is that we are already uh, involved in the in the uh, uh, type 2 diabetes uh, legend study, uh, which has just been launched uh, recently. Uh, wow, uh, of course, uh, as part of the Asian Pacific chapter, uh, I think we have we will commit ourselves to participate in all the APEC study as far as uh, we have the data to support it. And uh, uh, growing to, uh, as a chapter, we also hope that uh, one of the researchers or some of the researchers can lead one of the APEC or legend study as well. So with that, uh, that will be the end of uh, uh, the plan and mission for our Singapore chapter. And if anyone uh, interested to collaborate with us or have questions regarding uh, our studies or anything regarding our future plans, uh, do reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Shi, and I'm a chair of Odyssey Taiwan chapter, and I'm also the uh, associate professor at Taipei Medical University. 
Now let me share our regional updates and 2022 vision to you. Taipei Medical University is an university located in Taipei, the capital of Taiwan. It has three medical centers. And we have a hospital clinical database named Taipei Medical University uh, Clinical Research Database, TMUCRD, with 3.8 million patients across three large medical centers in Taiwan over the last 20 years. We have used uh, tools developed by uh, Odyssey for data processing and analysis, including headers, Athena, White Rabbits, Data Quality Dashboard, Achilles, and Atlas. And we have complete Odyssey OMOP Command Data Model and ETL before the end of um, 2020. And we also use the Atlas system. So uh, therefore, Taipei Medical University also accelerated Taiwan to become the six Odyssey members in Asia. At the beginning of this year, we established the Odyssey Taiwan office. It is currently co-chaired by Professor Mark Su and me. Mark is the Dean at the Office of Data Science in Taipei Medical University. In addition, Alex and Solly is, uh, are our computer scientists. And the phone specialty is health informatics. Yuda's specialty is biotech and healthcare management. And Benson and Yunin are our data scientists. Over the past year, we have participated in various Odyssey activities, including education and training on many topics. And we also joined many global and uh, APAC community call and also the international symposiums. At the same time, in order to attract more members, um, we had also handled various activities, on-site and online symposiums to help people to understand, to know Odyssey. So um, at the beginning of this year, we set up four goals to 2021. First one, to create an Odyssey Taiwan website. Second one, to develop another one to two sites and to create members, increase members. Third one, to participate in international research projects. The last one is to initiate the cross-national research projects. The first goal is to generate a website. So we have designed and built a basic website of Odyssey Taiwan. We also use Google translations, global multi-language automatic translation system. So users can uh, choose their own native language to browse the website. And we are gradually updating reference information on the website. The second goal is to interact with other university and hospitals in Taiwan. In order to promote Odyssey to more local people and recruit more members, up to now, in addition to our own three TMU hospitals, we have introduced Odyssey to six are the large medical centers in Taiwan. And we, we believe that more and more members will join Odyssey Taiwan chapter in the future. The third goal is to participate in international research projects. And in the past, we have joined in two in international studies. And then we have completed the analysis results and submit the manuscript to international journals successfully, including a hypertension study and a renatity study. Apart from participating in many international projects, we also plan to initiate a new cross-national uh, research project by ourselves. And uh, we will complete the protocol for um, the efficacy and the safety of uh, lung cancer drugs um, before the end of this year. And uh, we expect to have more friends from, our from other countries 
So join us in these projects. Uh, following the previous goals of 2021, we set up three visions to um, 2022. The first one, to get involved in more policy activities, like more special working groups. And second one, to join in more international research projects. And third one, to initiate more cross-national research projects. And then we plan to initiate at least two a uh, project including establishing a prediction model for complications of type 2 diabetes patients led by phone. And uh, another one is using artificial intelligence algorithms to establish models for predicting the safety of target therapies for colorectal cancer treatments led by uh, UDA. Thanks for your listening, and uh, we look forward to meeting all of you in the near future. Thanks. Hello, I'm Sun Chan Yu uh, in Korea. I'm really honored to present the Korean chapter of Odyssey 2021. Uh, here, I, I'd like to address the original update uh, of Korean chapter of Odyssey uh, in this year, and uh, we'll share the vision of Korea for the next year. So first of all, uh, I want to share the updates uh, in the data network of Korea. At the beginning of this year, uh, we've converted the HERAS data into AMOP CDM, uh, which is an, which is the Korean nationwide claim data. In this database, uh, we do have more than 50 million patients, uh, which is a virtually whole Korean population uh, from 2010 to 2019. In Korea, we have specialized uh, Odyssey platform, uh, which is the FederNet. Federated eHealth Big Data for Evidence Renovation Network. In this network, we have 40 organizations uh, and we have 50 million patients. Uh, especially, uh, there are more than 10,000 registries, researches executed uh, at this uh, platform. And overall, Odyssey Korea network includes uh, seven. Uh, 46 hospitals uh, and the number of patients exceeds the number of the total Korean population because of the publication. We can see that uh, the, the institutions with amoxidem are distributed in Korean, uh, Korean land. Now I'm going to address the pu publications using CDM uh, from Korea because there are too many publications using CDMs uh, in Korea, so I just, I need to cover only featured publications. Kang and uh, his colleagues developed deep learning technique uh, to assist mobile vocabulary mapping. And uh, the Korea University colleagues proposed the DA identification strategy to enhance anonymity of MOP CDM in a public cloud computing environment. Uh, these pa papers are published in the featured uh, featured journals, uh, Journal of American Medical Informatics Association and the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Uh, Dr. Moon and his colleagues uh, proposed an innovative strategy for standardized structure and structured and interoperable results in ophthalmic examination. And the colleagues in Aju University proposed a uh, developed a framework for NLP uh, using MOP CDM database. Uh, the name of the program is Socrates. There are many uh, population level estimation studies and uh, patient level prediction studies uh, published in this year from Korea. Uh, uh, one study, uh, uh, sub analysis of legend hypertension, was published in Hypertension and uh, Dr. So and her colleagues investigate the association between uh, association between proper pump inhibitor use and the gastric cancer. Uh, this paper was published in the GUT, which is the most prominent journal in gastroenterology. Dr. Lee and his colleagues uh, investigate the risk of lung cancer in patients with 
ACE inhibitor, uh, patient using ACE inhibitor compared with patients using ARB. And uh, they found no clear evidence uh, support the, supporting the association between the ACE inhibitor use and the incidence of lung cancer. They used seven Korean hospitals data uh, in the Freedom Net Network uh, platform. Now, I'd like to share the vision of Audit Korea for next year. We want to expand truly machine actionable city network. Uh, I mean, machine actionable, uh, we do have the research free zone in the Freedom Net platform. In the free research free zone, an individual researchers can execute uh, the study package against the against the CDM database of other institutions without any uh, further approval. Uh, only they, he or she needs the uh, on single IRB from uh, from the institution. So it is really machine actionable rather than uh, machine readable, and we hope that this. Network can be connected to the connected to the Addison AP network. Next, uh, we want to build a more small size CDM for a special purpose. Uh, there are many uh, data, um, special data that an individual register owns, such as biomarkers. These data cannot be shared with others uh, easily, so we want to build many small size CDM. So. We built a uh, small size CDM only for all our patients uh, with biomarkers for asthma. And it was really useful to study uh, asthma uh, and to, inv to investigate the association between bi biomarkers and the prognosis of the patients. Next, uh, we will build real time CDM network in Korea. Actually, it is not real time. Uh, I mean, uh, the CDM converted by uh, daily, monthly, or quarterly batch. So it is kind of near real-time CDM. This system can provide infrastructure of nationwide pragmatic clinical trial prospectively. And we hope that uh, leverage, we hope to leverage this system to build an infectious disease surveillance system uh, based on nationwide CDM network. Finally, I want to bring more Korean researchers to RDC APAC. Uh, the featured papers uh, I've shown uh, actually used uh, only Korean. Uh, most of these featured publications uh, used the uh, Korean uh, CDM databases. I hope that uh, in the future or in the next year, we can uh, we can do more research using RDC APAC network. Uh, research proposals from Korea will be addressed at the symposium lively. Thanks.